Imagining Life in Outer Space with Stephanie Drimmer of National Geographic. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week we examine what the oddities of life here on Earth can teach us about life on other worlds. Later in the show, we're going to welcome Stephanie Drimmer from National Geographic back to the show. Her new book, 5,000 Awesome Facts About Animals, is filled with amazing facts about, well, animals around the world. We're going to discuss her new work as well as play a game exploring what life on our home planet can teach us about life on other worlds. But first, let's imagine what life may possibly look like on alien planets. Naturally, we could imagine most anything we want with no regard whatsoever to science. Half the sci-fi movies in the 50s are testament to that. But let's instead use the tools of science to try to get a better idea of what life beyond the, beyond the Earth may actually look like. Now, just like life on Earth, life elsewhere is likely based on carbon, an element with unique properties which make it the ideal basis for life. Chemists know of more than 60 million molecules, and half of these are based on carbon. Life elsewhere would similarly almost certainly be organic. Now, water is also an ideal medium in which complex chemicals can combine, developing into more complex forms, particularly at the seafloor where water meets rock. Add some heat, you've got yourself a sweet recipe for the beginnings of life. Now, beyond the simplest beings, we might also expect to see physical feelings. Beings everywhere will need to know if they bump into something or someone. Ah! A sense of touch and pain is essential to survival and will likely be found in nearly all complex life forms, regardless of the planet. Life forms everywhere are also very likely to have means of detecting waves of pressure in any medium in which they live, the way we experience sound both in air and in water. Electromagnetic radiation also permeates the universe, and it is extremely likely alien life will detect these waves such as light or thermal, infra in thermal or infrared radiation. Having two or more eyes is essential for depth perception. Of more than 7.7 .7 million recognized species on Earth, just a handful have just one eye. And it includes 44 species of cyclops or water fleas. Next up, we welcome Stephanie Drimmer to the show. Her new book, 5,000 Awesome Facts About Animals, is just out from National Geographic. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined once again by Stephanie Trimmer. Her new book, 5,000 Awesome Facts About Animals, is now the number one new release in children's mystery and wonders books on Amazon. Welcome back to the show, Stephanie. Thanks for having me back. It's nice to chat with you again. Yeah, always a pleasure. Um, so, okay, we know we're, animals can definitely be weird. Can you tell us one of your one of your favorite weird animal facts? 
Sure. I'll hit you with a couple of quick um, weird ones, okay? Oh, please do. So, the more the merrier. Okay. <laughs> Um, so a black mamba snake, which is one of the most venomous snakes on the planet, can slither faster than a human can run. Mm. Um, there are ants of a particular species that will explode when they sense a threat to the colony. <laughs> um, <still> skill to have. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sort of the suicide bombers of the animal world. That's dark, but <laughs> it's pretty much what they are. Um, and one expert estimates that mosquitoes are responsible for killing half of all humans born throughout history, which really, I think, is really crazy. I mean, we know that mosquito-borne diseases um, are, have been really deadly throughout history, but half of humans ever born, it blows my mind. Yeah, that, that, that is absolutely incredible. Now, one of the things I really, really love this book is it isn't like one long piece, isn't like dividing the chip. It's just so full of facts, all right? I mean, we had Neil deGrasse Tyson on the show. We talked about, you know, the uh, FPP factor of a book, facts per page. <laughs> 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 and and this book is just so full of amazing individual facts about different types of animals. It's, it's just set up in a really interesting way. How'd that come about? How, what inspired that? Uh, that's really funny. I've never never heard of the FPP measure, but um, yeah, Neil yeah. and I made it up. <laughs> oh, oh, perfect. Well, I, I'm going to use it. We have spreads in this book. Uh, you know, two facing pages that have a hundred facts about a particular animal. Um, and that, that font can get a little small. So I think we are maxed out as far as the FPP <laughs> factor. Um, so Nat Geo Kids, they do these fact books all the time, uh, different topics, different formats. Fact books are something that they release at pretty much, I think every year, maybe every season. Um, and they're just always a big hit. Uh, and I, I think it's obvious why. I mean, kids... Sometimes it can be, especially for kids who are learning to read, reading is hard, it takes a lot of brain power, it can be really intimidating to pick up a book and have to kind of get through the whole thing page by page. This book is not like that. It's designed so you can pick it up, you can just pick a random fact on a random page, you can skip around, put it down, pick it back up, put it down. It's really not intimidating. Um, there's a low bar for entry to kind of start reading. So it's great for like, you know, road trips or just having around on the coffee table. Um, it's really good for kids who are maybe a little more reluctant readers mm -hmm. um, to kind of break them into reading in a really fun and easy way. Um, yeah, it's not like homework designed to be just super fun. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's a Fabulous idea. And kids are, I believe, natural born scientists. They're always asking questions. And Absolutely. That, and that is something that doesn't always carry over until adulthood. So how do we keep that sense of wonder of children alive as they grow up? Yeah, that I that you hit on, you know, something that's really near and dear to my heart. I think you're absolutely right. Kids are born curious, and that gets beaten out of us a little bit. Um, I think that we live, we're fortunate to live in this age where answers are so accessible. Mm -hmm. um, any Because we all have the internet, anybody can really figure out anything at any time. And I, you know, we're always looking stuff up on our phones. And I think teaching your kids that you can figure out answers and that's cool and exciting is a great way to show them to be curious. And also, you know, that I think it's important to share with kids that it's not like because you're an adult, you have all the answers. And in fact, you know, the more you know, the more questions you have. And um, I think just teaching them that it's cool to have questions and fun to look them up and exciting to learn um, is, is a great thing to teach them rather than, you know, adulthood means that you have everything figured out and adults know all the answers. Um, it's just, it's not true. And it's just boring. Right. right. And, um, 
over the last couple of hundred years, one of the great advances science has made is in our understanding of the evolution of life. What can weird facts about animals teach us and kids, especially about evolution? Oh, that's that's such a good connection to make. Um, yeah, the reason that we have such weird animals is that they have evolved into all of these crazy little niches, right? I mean, um, animals that have evolved to live in really specific places, like the tippy tops of mountains, or, you know, uh, there are all kinds of animals that live in caves that are blind, um, and they evolved from sighted ancestors. Um, they lost their senses. So that's an animal that, you know, none of us had eyesight a long time ago. That ability evolved. And then these specific animals later lost that ability because it was more beneficial to them to not devote that energy to eyesight in a dark world. That is super weird. Um, mm. And yeah, I mean, every animal that exists, there's a, an evolutionary pathway for how it got to be that weird and wonderful. And um, it's a great segue to talk, talk about evolution. All right. And of course, the ultimate, I think the next big step in evolution is going to be learning that we're not alone in the cosmos that there, so. that there is life elsewhere and even if it is you know the equivalent of cyanobacteria you know most primitive you know sorts of life so what i'd like you to do we now know about five thousand exoplanets um worlds around other suns i'd like you to imagine three different worlds and try to tell us what sort of animal life on Earth might uh, might stand a chance on these worlds? <laughs> All right. So first. Okay. I, like, I, I love it. Let's do I, it. All right. So first world, we're going to imagine a large water planet that's okay. half, that is half frozen. Okay. It, its nighttime side is eternally iced over and its hot side is its daytime side is warm. Uh -huh. What sort of animal do you imagine living there? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about uh, tidally locked planets, which we're yes. finding out are so common yes. in the universe. Um, and I think uh, scientists are increasingly thinking are, you know, it used to be like, oh, this planet is tidally locked, therefore it could not support life. And that's a like sort of Earth-centric view, right? Our planet mm -hmm. is not tidally locked. And um, that allows us to have weather and all sorts of things that we think are necessary. But um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, tidally locked planets can support life. And I think there are a few of them that are, are good candidates. Um, so that makes me think of, um, and it's a little bit different situation, but it makes me think of hydrothermal vent animals Yes, um, that live in, um, probably the most extreme environment on earth. Um, so we're talking about hydrothermal vents in the ocean floor that are spewing out superheated chemical laden water it can be about 750 degrees. I mean, it is extremely hot. Um, these are animals that totally changed our perception of life because their basis for energy is not photosynthesis from the sun, which is the basis of life at the surface. Um, their basis is chemicals found in these hydrothermal vents. Um, and when scientists discovered these animals in the 1970s, it just totally kind of blew open what we think of as, as possibilities for life. Um, talking specifically about some sort of world where there's like this huge temperature differential, there are animals that exist in these hydrothermal vents sort of living on the very edge of this superheated water, literally with their heads in the superheated water and their tails in this sometimes very cold water that can be, you know, we're talking about the deep, deep ocean. This water is about at almost at freezing temperature. Um, and so those are animals that exist within this huge temper differential just in their own bodies. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about a planet that is, that is uh, almost frozen, the temper temperature differential probably wouldn't even be that extreme. Um, so I think we've already got animals that can, can do that kind of thing 
on earth. And it's, it's not a stretch of the imagination to imagine that something like that could live in the sort of icy, tidally locked planet that you're imagining. Wow, that's great. It's so fascinating. Um, and second world, it's a hot world uh, with very little water, um, where, you know, sun is beating down at you all the time, much like Arizona in summer. Uh -huh. <laughs> what can survive there? Um, we, so we have a lot of, I would say, analogous environments to that on earth. We have a lot of deserts, um, some of them hot deserts that we like Tucson, some of them cold deserts, something we don't traditionally think of when we think of a desert. Um, Antarctica. but yeah, um, right. Antarctica would be a cold desert. That's because the desert is defined by um, the amount of rainfall. Right. And um, there's very little water in Antarctica. Anyway, that's a weird aside. But the animal that that makes me think of is um, the Namib desert beetle. That, mm. that might not be the right, but it's a beetle that lives there. And there's basically no water. Like, I don't think it rains at all. And um, it's necessary. Water is necessary for survival, obviously. Every life form that we know of depends on water. There's no water there, yet this beetle survives. Um, and what it does is it travels to the tops of dunes and it assumes this very specific posture with its rear end pointing up and it waits for the morning fog to roll in. There's no rain, but there is fog. When the fog rolls in, this beetle's back is specifically engineered to capture dew and funnel it through these bumps on the beetle's back directly into the beetle's mouth. And so, yeah. And so it has figured out this way to harvest water from a rainless desert. And the, the uh, yeah, it's, it's back is something that materials scientists are studying right. as a way to collect water in, um, in super dry environments for, for human use. And so, um, yeah, that's something that I could maybe imagine something like that existing on a extremely hot and dry planet. Wow. Wow. And actually for a few years, Paul McCartney did live in Tucson. So we know beetles can live in the desert. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you have 5,000, 5,000 awesome facts in this book, awesome facts in this book. Um, what, what surprised you the most to learn as you were putting, assembling them? Oh gosh. Um, it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but kind of everything because, and, and I only say that because um, the Nat Geo sort of benchmark is weird but true. Mm -hmm. Facts to be included in any of their books have to be weird but true. And if you think about it, you know, that sounds very simple and it is, um, but it's also kind of a high bar uh, because there are lots of facts that are amazing or surprising and true, but they're not weird. And um, so to Fit in this book, all 5,000 of these facts are in some capacity weird. Um, yeah, I mean, really all of them. So it, it's, it makes it really fun. Yeah, that's great. And finally, um, I'm just, uh, just imagining like Dr. Doolittle. Let's imagine humans could communicate freely and openly with animals. How would that change our relationship to them? I mean, I, it would change it completely. I, I think that we know we can grasp the idea that animals communicate with each other, um, that animals have deep emotions. You know, I sort of personally think that emotions are like a deeply ingrained evolutionary survival trait and that your dog sure does love you. And whales certainly have uh, emotional feelings about the other animals in their social groups and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, being able to crack the code into animal language and figure out what they're talking about would be just it's completely amazing. I know there are scientists 
working on this, um, specifically with dolphins. That's a big area um, for this kind of work. Um, there's a scientist, her name's Denise Herzing. She's been working for years to develop a dolphin translator. Mm -hmm. um, it's this keyboard that uh, has I think, three or four keys and it plays a sound that the researchers have taught the dolphins in this wild pod in the Bahamas, I think. Um, each sound refers to a specific thing in their environment that they like. One of them is seaweed, which dolphins like to play uh, games with, like hide and seek and fetch. <laughs> and um, one is uh, inviting the dolphins to take a ride on the bow of their, the wave off the bow of their boat which dolphins love to do, they love to surf. Um, anyway, they've spent a long time teaching these dolphins um, that these sounds are associated with words in an attempt to communicate with the dolphins. Um, can they teach the dolphins uh, these sounds? Can they teach the dolphins that the sound means something? And can they get the dolphins to use the sounds themselves? Um, and they have recorded one of the dolphins, I think, using one of the sounds back at the researchers um, to tell them that it wanted to play with some seaweed with them. So um, that's like research in its infancy, but um, you know, actually speaking with animals and breaking the language barrier between them sounds really far out, but it's research that scientists are actually working on. So you know, it could be something that we kind of break more and more into in our lifetimes, which, I mean, I think we'd all love to learn what the dolphins are saying. All right. Well, thanks so much for being on the show again, Stephanie. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And that was Stephanie Drimmer, author of 5,000 Awesome Facts About Animals from National Geographic Kids. Check it out. The first signs of life on other worlds are likely to come in the form of telltale chemical markers found in the atmos atmospheres of planet exoplanets, or possibly from vast oceans of water on some of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn. Now, most importantly, evolution drives the development of life on Earth, and this process will also take place on other worlds. For eons, life on Earth was composed of nothing but cyanobacteria, often mislabeled blue-green algae. Nearly every search for life on other worlds has looked for radio signals from intelligent species. Now we have the ability to find evidence for the most primitive life on other worlds. The James Webb Space Telescope and other instruments have the ability to find telltale signs of even the most basic life on other, on other worlds. This discovery is nearly certain to happen in the coming years and it will change our views of the cosmos forever. Join us next week on the Cosmic Companion for It's Just a Little Baby Planet. We're going to be joined by Fang Long from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. We're going to learn all about the formation of planets and solar systems. Make sure to join us starting on, on the 18th of October. Speaking of Halloween, come back the following week for our spooky Halloween episode, Death in Death Space! In space. We're going to be joined by Kevin Heath, founder of Space Crystals. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please subscribe, follow, and share this program anywhere or everywhere. I'm not fussy. Clear skies. <laughs>